If God is all good and all powerful, then why does he allow evil to continue? And, and from a Christian perspective, the, the question really is, why does he allow moral evil? And, and there are a lot of, of passages in scriptures that deal with the problem of evil from various perspectives. Um, but I, I think none addresses it more fully uh, than the book of Habakkuk does. Uh, because in, and Habakkuk is dealing both with what we might say natural evil in, this, in, in the sense of, of war and devastation, but because it is war, it's also the question of moral evil. And Habakkuk is wrestling why God is permitting this incredibly wicked nation to do such terrible violence to God's people. And in the course of this, we not only see you know, the, the, the prayer of Habakkuk, we see in chapter 2 the answer of God. And, and part of that answer is verse, verses 2 and 3. It says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. That verse 3 is, is crucial in our understanding of God's answer here to Habakkuk, which I will summarize and say God says, I'm going to judge evil. Um, that's really the gist of the rest of chapter 2. But the statement there, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry, is a promise of a Savior. If you remember when we went through Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 10 verse 37 quotes Habakkuk, and it replaces the it with he. In, in the Hebrew, the word is legitimately could be either it or he. It, so it, it, either way it works. He, he, Hebrews chapter 10, he is addressing the return of Jesus. And, and, the, and the promise here of Habakkuk 2 is a promise that there is one who is coming to bring judgment. And as we think about this whole question of why God allows moral evil, we cannot answer this question without thinking about and addressing what Jesus has done and will do. So very quickly, remind us of where uh, moral evil began. We see it starting with Lucifer in his own pride, rejecting his created purpose, rebelling against his creator. So that as I, as I mentioned, in, you know, what Satan did is very similar to what Paul describes in Romans chapter 1. Satan refused to glorify God, to give God the thanks and praise that was due to him, but instead worshipped and served the creature, in this case himself. He sought the exaltation of himself, became an idolater by worshiping self instead of God. And so he, in, in doing so, is rejecting what, what he was created to do and is rebelling against his creator. And that is where sin enters into this world. Satan distorting his created purpose distorting the gifts that were given to him to twist them to a purpose that God did not intend them to be used for. And we have then Lucifer, Satan, deceiving Eve, Adam disobeying so that ultimately man is seeking their own will. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, God has made man upright, but man has sought out his own devices. Man has pursued his own wisdom and own purposes and thinking rather than the will of God. 
And so that man sins and sin comes into the world by falling really into the same kind of sin that Lucifer fell into of seeking to elevate self to be like God and in doing so rejecting the purposes and the place in which they were created, the position that God gave to them. And so we define moral evil as that which does not conform to the perfection plan and purpose of God, that which in some way distorts and pollutes what God has created. And, and I say that carefully because I want to remind us, we're talking about this question of evil, it's not a question of something that is created. It, it's not something that somebody had to bring into existence in the way that we think about gravity or time. Rather, evil is that which takes which God has created perfectly and by the addition, of the inappropriate addition of something makes it evil. And so that which is now polluted, the perfect purposes of God. And so, we again, we're reviewing here, so I'll quickly mention, why did God allow moral evil? We talked about uh, very, Romans chapter 9, just very briefly, that through his choosing the vessels of wrath to reveal his glory. And so it is, it is possible, and I, I would say likely, that God is allowing moral evil because it is, it is a better revelation of his glorious character. It's through the allowance of moral evil that man is better able to see God's glory. Now, I, I will say, as I said a few weeks ago, that does not mean that God had to allow moral evil because it better revealed his character, but rather that he chose to because it better revealed his character. And that's an important distinction. Um, we also see that uh, it, through the existence and entrance of sin into the world, it elevates the praise of God. And so that God allows moral evil for the increase of his praise. So we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, and, and I trust you know that, and are familiar with this entire uh, first half of Ephesians chapter 2, because it talks about that we are dead in our trespass and sin. We're under the tyranny of Satan. But God, who is rich in mercy, brings to us salvation by grace. And he does so that we, in the ages of, to come, that we who are saved by God's grace might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so because God has permitted moral evil, we now who have been uh, corrupted by that evil so that we are dead in trespasses and sins, under the tyranny of Satan so that we are enslaved to wickedness, Yet God, in his mercy, gives to us salvation, which delivers us from death, gives us life, redeems us from bondage, and gives us liberty. Takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and translates us into the kingdom of his dear son. So that all that sin does, Christ has reversed and does reverse when we are saved. And the end result of this is that in eternity to come, the riches of his grace will be set on display. Some have summarized this verse and referred to it, uh, taking the phrase trophies of grace out of this. That we now become trophies displaying the grace of God. That because of our wickedness, we, we now, it, it, sets, it offsets it and puts it in relief so that we can better see the magnificence of the grace of God. And, and we see that even further, Philippi, or Ephesians chapter 3, that now 
we see through the church, this is what he's addressing there, the, the forming together Jew and Gentile into one body. And the reason for this is that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So that we have in the church the redeemed body of Christ formed out of not just Jews, but Jew and Gentile, brought together in this body, that now we are making known, we are manifesting the, the brilliant display of the wisdom of God. And so that, and, and, and I think this, we can tie this legitimately into 1 Peter chapter 1, where Peter's talking about the gospel and says which things the angels desire to look into. They peer down at this plan of salvation and marvel. And, and that it is through the redemption from sin that we make known the incredible wisdom of God. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 11, after he spent 11 chapters talking about the gospel, he, he, he marvels at the depths and the height, the greatness of the wisdom of God. He launches into praise because of the wisdom displayed in the gospel that redeems men from sin. And so, I think, again, it's possible, I would say likely, that God has permitted moral evil to continue. God permitted the entrance of moral evil as a way of displaying more fully his grace to sinners. So there's a, an aspect of displaying his glory, and there's an aspect of displaying his grace. Again, not that he had to, but that he chose to. And then ultimately, and I think this is, this is the most likely of all, all of the suggestions here, is we're not going to know. We're certainly not going to know fully until we reach heaven. Deuteronomy says very simply, the secret things belong to the Lord. That does not mean that God whispers into our heart secret things that aren't revealed in the Bible. What it actually means is God has revealed certain things to you. You know that. God has not revealed certain things to you. You can't know that. You're not going to know that until the Lord chooses to make them manifest, which in this case, because revelation is complete, is when we reach heaven. Maybe. <laughs> it still depends on how much God makes known. Ultimately, what this gets down to is, is we cannot fully answer why God allowed moral evil to enter his creation. The Bible doesn't tell us that. And, and so what we go back to and we have to go to is what scriptures tells us about the character of God. So that we, we really, we, we, if we're going to be completely honest on this issue, we're going to say, ultimately, I don't know. What I do know is God is good, righteous, just, holy, loving. That is unmistakable. And so that what, whatever reasons they may be for permitting moral evil, they do not impugn his character in any way. His reasons are always going to be holy, righteous, just, kind, good, loving reasons. Always. And, and where we come to the point of really, by faith, accepting that God is exactly who God says he is. And even when I... And like Habakkuk and say, God, how can you do this? I still trust that he is exactly as he says he is. And we see this manifest in how God solves the problem of moral evil. So God is not at all complicit in the existence of moral evil. He's not morally responsible, but he is actively Working, He is doing something to resolve the problem of moral evil. And we find that, as I've already said, in Christ. So that Jesus conquered evil on the cross. 
And, and we cannot, as we're thinking about this, whether it be personally or we're talking to somebody who le- raises this as a legitimate objection, we cannot downplay the work of Jesus on the cross. Because when we talk about what Jesus did, it's not just that he forgives our sins. I mean, I say just as if that's a trivial thing. That is glorious. But he did far more than forgive sins. In his work on the cross, he conquers evil. So that we see Colossians chapter 2 tells us that he disarmed principalities and powers. When we see that phrase principalities and powers in the New Testament, just speaking of, of angelic and spiritual forces and Every case that I know of, it's only a couple of them, uh, it's specifically speaking of demonic forces. So you have the powers of evil, those spiritual forces who are working evil and bent upon evil. He disarmed them. He made a public spectacle of them. He paraded their defeat before the eyes of all. So when Christ died on the cross, he took away our sin. Verse 14 tells us that. Verse 15 tells us he also disarmed, he defeated the principalities and powers, and his, by, I would say by his resurrection, he showed their defeat. We see in 1 John chapter 3 that for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? The first work of the devil is the work of deceit, of leading men into sin. And then subsequent works after that. But he's not saying he's come to destroy you know, the atomic bomb so that it doesn't blow up the world. Or he's come to destroy man's predation of nature. It, dealing with the, 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 the ultimate spiritual works that are the cause of the various other problems. That Christ, when he died on the cross... He set an end. He defeated Satan. Which is why, one reason why Jesus could say that he saw Satan as a, as a star falling from the sky. Basically, Satan being launched out of heaven. Revelation 12 tells us it's still a future day when Satan is finally evicted and denied further entrance into heaven. But Revelation 12 tells us that Satan will be cast out to the earth. Of, cast out of heaven. He's going to have a brief brief time in which he works his final works on the earth and then he's going to be cast into prison be released again for a brief time lead one more rebellion and then utterly overthrown destroyed in an instant and cast into the lake of fire forever and so when we say why has not god why did god allow moral evil I can't answer that question fully, but I can say God has addressed the problem. He is addressing the problem. He will address the problem. We also see that Jesus is returning to conquer all evil in the world. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, it tells us, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels... In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the power, the glory of his power. So we see not just that Jesus conquers spiritual evil and the forces of spiritual evil, not just that Jesus conquers Satan and the demons, but we look around the world And we look at men and we say, how do men do wicked things? Why does God allow the horrific things that happen? I'm not going to catalog them again. We can think through our minds and think through, really, just think through history. And and man has done vile things to man. What 2 Thessalonians tells us is that Jesus is returning and he is going to take vengeance on all who do not know God, all who, I want to say, do evil. He is going to exact justice. So not only does he conquer, he judges. 
And, and that's crucial as we think about this. Revelation chapter 20 talks about those who stand before God and their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. All of them are cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, it's not up, it's not up on the screen. Um, Revelation chapter 20 speaks of they're judged according to their work. So the reality is that God is going to bring justice to every individual for their wicked deeds. I remember when Saddam Hussein was hung, and there was a lot of stuff going on on the internet about all of that. And one of the things that I saw was people complaining that it, you know it was such a quick end. And to someone who had caused so much harm and had tormented so many people. And there was a sense, uh, and a right sense, really, of we didn't get justice. Yeah, he was executed, he can't do it anymore, but there, he really, he didn't suffer near as bad as the people that he tormented suffered. And, and, and we talk about justice, it really is affecting a punishment that is it's the equivalent of the crime committed. And, and so that there's, there's a appropriateness, a fitting, a correlation between the, the punishment and the crime. And we recognize on this earth that there's oft, often is not, even when somebody is punished, it's not near what they deserve. There's coming a day in which all men will, all who are unsaved, will be punished according to their deserts. So that Saddam Hussein did not get off easy. Not because of the justice of men, but because of the justice of God. And and. And we, we should not, we, we really, we should not exalt, exalt in the suffering of individuals. But when we talk about this question of evil and why moral evil exists and why God allows it, we have to recognize that there is justice coming. It is certain. And, and so that then they will have the full weight of the consequences of their evil. We also see there's coming a day when God will remove all evil from the universe. So there will, will now be this new creation, the new heaven and new earth. The new earth will be populated by the redeemed. There will be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. The death, sorrow, crying are gone. Not just because God says everything's going to be happy. But because God takes away the cause of death. Sin. The cause of sorrow. Sin. The cause of pain is gone. He's removed them all. And so that God is dealing with the problem of evil. And at that point in time, somebody is probably going to say, well, what's he waiting for? Okay, if all of that is true, why is he still letting evil continue? Second Peter chapter 3 answers that question. Verse 8, he says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and as a thousand years as one day. So he's quoting the Psalms and saying God does not measure time in the way that we do. Uh, he's not driven by time in the way that we are. M verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. God has promised to remove evil. And, and the, the charge is that he is somehow derelict in his duty because he's not done it yet. And what Peter says is, no, this is not a laziness. He's not, he's not hedging on his promise and backing off and saying, well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. When I get around to it, when I feel like it, 
That's not it at all. He's not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So there is a very specific reason why God has not yet removed all evil from the universe. It's mercy. He is giving opportunity for more to repent. And until he decides that that opportunity is done, he continues to give. It is a merciful delay. Because when Jesus comes, and this is part of where I think most people do not understand what they're actually saying when they say, well, if God is real, if God is good, he needs to take care of the problem of evil right now. Most people mean he needs to take care of the Hitlers and the Husseins, the really awful people. They do not mean he needs to take care of me. But that's what they're saying. Because if, if they have not yet believed in Jesus, when God, Christ returns to judge the world, then that one who is protesting that God should get on with things is going to find themselves under judgment and wrath, not wrath, mercy and salvation. They will find themselves condemned alongside the ones that they think should be condemned. And they do not recognize that God's actually giving them space to repent. That they're able to complain about God's justice because God has shown mercy to them. They're not recognizing that. And it's, it'd be, it is profitable to wisely, at some point in that conversation, point them to their own evil. And say, look, I understand how severe things are. I understand how tragic this is. But you need to understand that when Christ returns, you're no longer going to have an opportunity to repent. And if Christ returns with you still in this condition of rejection and of doubt, you will also be condemned. So you're complaining and demanding that God hurry up and come condemn you. And, and helping them see the true weight of what they're saying. That God's mercy, God's delay is merciful. So what we get down to as we, we think about this problem of evil is Jesus. It really, it's where we have to go. That is the, the, the answer. It tells us that God is working and resolving this problem. It tells us that God himself has suffered in, alongside of us in, in, as, because of evil. Yeah, we go to the cross and we see the suffering of God the Son. He, he himself has been pained. His heel has been wounded because of evil. So we're not dealing with a God who is disinterested and unfeeling, but who has inserted himself into a problem that is not his because he's the only one who can provide a solution. And he has provided that solution. And ultimately, the question of the problem of evil should be pointed towards a call to repentance of personal sin so that I may be right before God and not under his wrath. Uh, uh, so let me give you a few passages. If you're thinking about how do I study this further, there are, there's a number of passages in Scripture that address this question. Of course, you probably already thought about Job and the question of why does God allow the innocent to suffer? That really is what, God, what Job is wrestling with. Why does God allow the innocent one to suffer? The book of Ecclesiastes is wrestling with this same problem. It's wrestling with, is there any value in life? Is this meaningless? Or is there some purpose here? 
And so it, it wrestles with the, the apparent meaningless, meaninglessness caused by evil. Psalm 73, a great one for the Christian to be, be very familiar with. Why do the wicked prosper? Because he starts there and he goes and realizes their end. You also have the book of Habakkuk. Why does God allow, how can God allow terrible evil to take place? And, and again, that one points us to Christ. It ends with this incredible praise. Psalm 37. The question of, uh, uh, or the exhortation in that psalm to not envy the wicked because it seems the wicked prosper. And so the challenge to, to believers, to the righteous, is to not envy them in their apparent prosperity. And then Romans chapter 9, God is sovereignly working in the world, even in evil and evil men, to show his glory. And we do well to consider what Romans 9 teaches us about God's sovereignty over evil to accomplish his purposes. Let me, let me end with just a quick summary here of, of everything we've covered. And I'm very brief. First, moral evil is real. It's not imaginary. It's not an illusion or messed up thinking it's real. Moral evil was not created by God in any way. God did permit it, but without in any way being culpable, morally responsible for the existence of moral evil. And that's to understand there's challenges there as we start talking about that and thinking through that. But those are all things that scriptures affirms that we also must affirm. Um, the reasons that God permits moral evil are not known. Ultimately, we don't know. But the character of God assures us that God has permitted moral evil for a greater purpose. That his allowance of moral evil is truly good and holy. That the existence of moral evil will result in the eternal exaltation of God's glory, that the existence of moral evil will result in eternal blessing that is far greater than the temporal suffering, that will result in eternal blessing for the children of God, that God himself has suffered alongside creation as a result of moral evil, and that God himself has done all that is necessary to redeem those captured by moral evil and to repair the damage caused by moral evil. So that in the end, God will judge and eradicate all moral evil. And we cannot lose sight of that. 